Well, good morning. We are continuing our time of working through the gospel of Mark. This morning, we're going to be looking at the first 13 verses of the book of Mark. And uh, I would invite you to please stand as you're turning to the first chapter of Mark. We're going to be looking at Mark chapter 1, verses 1 through 13. We stand out of honor and reverence to God, the author of this word, acknowledging that this is the very word of God. Gospel of Mark is found toward the beginning of the New Testament. That's the second book of the New Testament. This is the way Mark begins his gospel. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As it is written in Isaiah the prophets, Behold, I send my messenger before your face who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. John appeared, baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And all the country of Judea and all Jerusalem were going out to him and were being baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair and wore a leather belt around his waist and he ate locusts and wild honey. And he preached, saying, After me comes he who is mightier than I, the strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee, and was baptized by John in the Jordan. When he came up out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, you are my beloved son, with you I am well pleased. The spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness, and he was in the wilderness 40 days, being tempted by Satan. He was with the wild animals, and the angels were ministering to him. Would you please be seated as we pray? God, we acknowledge that we need your spirit to reveal truth to us, that this is the word of God concerning your only son, Jesus Christ. God, we are those who stand in constant need of your grace and your mercy. We need the good word, the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ to transform us, God, unto salvation, but also to sanctify us in Christ. And so this morning, we pray, Lord Jesus, that your spirit would come as it descended on you, that it would descend in this place, illuminating the truth of this text, that we might be transformed because of it. Father, we love you. We pray these things in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. We've been coming back to this introduction to Mark. I think it's important to set these passages in their context. And so last week we we looked at the fact that Mark in his gospel is is pointing the people towards uh, uh, the king, this King Jesus. Mark is writing this book in Rome. He's writing to uh, an audience of Romans and he's trying to help them understand that there is a king who is greater than Caesar. He wants these Roman Gentiles to understand that the good news of the gospel of this King Jesus, it is better news than than anyone could ever imagine. And so last week we looked in depth at this forerunner, this herald who came before Jesus, John the Baptist, who came to prepare the way for the king. And we talked about the fact that in this culture, and even still today in our culture, it's common for a king or a high-ranking official to send someone to go before them to announce to the people that, that they're coming. It was very common for a, a forerunner to, to come into a town or a village. If the king wanted to make an announcement in a town or a village, he would send a forerunner. The king doesn't want to come and make an announcement to nobody. The king doesn't stoop to speak to an, an empty room, and so they would send a, a forerunner, a herald, to go ahead of them and proclaim and gather the people together and say, hey, the king is coming, and the king's got a message, and you need to be ready. You need to gather together. You need to prepare because the king is coming. And so last week we looked at this passage about John the Baptist, the herald of the king who came to proclaim 
that the king was coming. And this week, as we see the baptism of the Lord Jesus, the long-awaited Messiah, the king of kings, we see the coronation of a king. Last week, it was the proclamation about the king. This week, we will look at the coronation of the king. But even before Mark introduced to us this herald who, who would come and announce the coming of the king, he, he, he actually took us back to the Old Testament to show us, the, the reader, and to show those readers in the first century in Rome that there were actually multiple voices that God had sent to inform the people that the, the herald was coming. That, that multiple times in multiple uh, places and, and in multiple occasions in the Old Testament, God had actually sent voices to, to let people know that there's one coming who will be a, a herald of the king, that this man, John the Baptist, is coming before the Messiah, the Christ, comes. It's interesting, in, in Mark chapter 1, verse 2, he says that he's quoting Isaiah, but in fact, in this short passage, he actually quotes the books of Exodus and Isaiah and Malachi. I, I think for the sake of brevity, he, he mentions the most uh, you know, important or the most significant of the prophets that he quoted, but he's quoting from three Old Testament places. And what Mark is doing as he's pointing us to John the Baptist, who will point us to Christ, is he's, he's drawing us with John the Baptist out into the desert, into the wilderness. One of the things that we need to understand as we're beginning our time, and we'll be for several months looking through this important book, the Gospel of Mark, is that one of the literary tools that Mark uses in his Gospel to help us understand what he's doing is Mark uses geography to sort of create different settings. And so we're going to see as we work our way through the Gospel of Mark that when Jesus and the disciples, when their geography changes, that the point of the passage changes with him. And so you'll see oftentimes Mark will say, well, then they went across the lake to do this, and then they went back across the lake to do this, and then they went up into Jerusalem to do this. And so when the book of Mark, when the geography changes, that's a, a very significant point. Well, it's interesting also that Mark begins his gospel out into the wilderness, in, in the wilderness. And as I said before, I think what Mark's doing here is he's trying to draw us with John the Baptist out into the, the desolate places, quoting these three Old Testament passages which all speak of the Messiah, the one who is to come, the King, and directing our hearts out into the wilderness. God has always used the wilderness to factor in very significant ways in the story of the relationship between Him and His people. God took His people through a serious season of testing in the wilderness as he was preparing to lead them out of captivity in Egypt and into the promised land. And so God here, in, in his sovereign control, this word inspired by the Spirit, he's taking us into the wilderness to see some significant things. So as we looked at last week, Mark tells us in verse 5 of the passage we looked at last week that all of Judea and all of Jerusalem were going out into the wilderness to be baptized by John. That God, through this prophet John, the baptizer, was drawing Israel once again out into the wilderness in a season of preparation to receive what he had for them. The people were leaving their homes their villages, their towns, even coming down from Jerusalem, from on high, to be instructed, for their hearts to be prepared, drawn out into the wilderness. It's very interesting because for the people of Israel, everything about their existence centered on one thing. For the people of Israel, it, it was always all about the temple, 
Because everything for Israel revolved around worship. You have to understand, and I wish that this were uh, more uh, of the heart of the, the modern Christian, and I, and I long and, and hope that it would be, but for the people of Israel, they were consumed with this idea of worshiping the one true God. And for them, worship, the ultimate place of worship, was in the temple. The temple is the center of worship. The, the temple is it's the place of sacrifice. The temple is, is literally where the Spirit of God dwells. For the first century Jew, everything about their existence centered on the temple which was in Jerusalem. But Mark wants us to understand that immediately before Jesus begins his earthly ministry, immediately before God is ushering in a new covenant with the people, a covenant not of, of the law, but a covenant of grace, that he's drawing Israel out into the wilderness, away from the temple. So the people of Israel are going out, away from Jerusalem, to be baptized by John. I, I think Mark wants our hearts and our minds, if we're going to immerse ourselves in this gospel, this good news concerning the person and work of Jesus Christ, to really feel the, a sense of presence and a connection with the people of Israel out in the desolate places in the wilderness. As John is baptizing this, with his baptism of repentance, calling upon the people of Israel to, to make ready their hearts for the coming Messiah by confessing their sin Repenting from sin and being baptized is a symbol that they have been washed clean and prepared for the Messiah who is coming, this King who is coming. He's coming to interact with His people in a new way, and John wants their hearts to be prepared. And so the passage says that all throughout Judea, and, and, and all, all from Jerusalem, that there were dozens and dozens and scores of people who were coming out into the desolate places. And John was engaged daily. We, we think probably for a period of, of over six months that daily John was engaged in this ministry of calling upon people to repent and baptizing them in a baptism of repent, repentance for the, for the conf and, and confessing their sins. And as he's going about this this ministry, I mean, you can imagine this ministry where hundreds of people are lined up on the banks of the river and John is, is he's, he's ministering to them, he's baptizing them. And Mark tells us in the passage we're looking at this morning in verse 9, In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. She, I love the way that the Apostle John describes this first face-to-face -face meeting between Jesus and John the Baptist. In, in John chapter 1, beginning in verse 29, John gives his account. This is the Apostle John giving the uh, account of the baptism of Jesus by John the Baptist. He, he says in John 1, 29, the next day he, John the Baptist, he saw Jesus coming towards him, he's, he's ministering to these people, he's baptizing them. People are coming by, by scores to be baptized. And as John is busy ministering to these people, he looks up and he sees Jesus coming towards him. And John records this, that, that John the Baptist looks up and he says, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Behold, the, the Lamb of God who, who takes away the sins of the world. And John's account, he goes on to say, he, he records the words of John the Baptist as saying, This is him. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who ranks before me because he was before me. John recounts this instance of John the Baptist busy doing the work that God had called him to out in the wilderness, in desolate places, withdrawn from society, and the people were flocking to him, and he looks up, and he sees the Lord Jesus Christ, and he says, Behold the Lamb of God. I mean, this is it. 
Everything that God's people had been waiting for, for generation after generation, everything that all of the prophets had longed for, everything that all of the kings were pointing for, everything that all of the priests had been preparing the people for, for thousands of years, for generation after generation, and John is busy baptizing in the wilderness. He's called Israel out to him, away from their high places, into these desolate places, and he sees the Lord. Lord, the sacrificial lamb of God who will be slaughtered to, to take away the sin of the world. This is the first face-to-face -face meeting between Jesus and, and John the Baptist, but it was not the first time that they had met. It may sound confusing to you. They had met, but they had never seen each other face to face. Their first meeting was roughly 30 years prior. Remember that John and Jesus were related and their mothers were pregnant at the same time. Both Mary and Elizabeth had become pregnant in rather extraordinary circumstances. Luke chapter 1 records this first ever meeting of Jesus and John the Baptist as they were both infant children in their mother's womb. I'm going to turn over and look at this account in Luke chapter 1 beginning in verse 39. It says this, in those days Mary arose and went with haste into the hill country to a town in Judah. And she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. And when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, the baby leapt in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. And she exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why is this granted to me, that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For behold, when the sound of your greeting came to my ears, the baby in my womb leapt for joy. And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. This is actually the second meeting of John the Baptist and Jesus. And so you could imagine, uh, people have speculated, well, how, how was it that John the Baptist recognized Jesus if they had never seen each other face to face. And the, the text doesn't answer that question, but the reality is that 30 years prior, the Spirit had caused the infant child, John the Baptist, in the womb of his mother to leap for joy at the presence of the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, and that same Spirit, as John was baptizing in the wilderness, caused him to look up and recognize that the Lord was present. You know, it's interesting. As you try to harmonize the four Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Though, though they're all four inspired of the Holy Spirit, though they're, they're all four in perfect harmony, they focus on uh, different things and they tell us uh, from a different perspective. And so Mark here in the passage we're looking at this morning, he begins his account of Jesus 30 years into the life of Jesus. He completely skips over the first 30 years of Jesus' life. No mention of Mary or Joseph, no Christmas story, no mangers or wise men. There's nothing of Jesus' lineage or his birth or his childhood. Mark jumps directly to the first public appearance of Jesus by simply telling us in a very matter-of-fact way that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and he was baptized by John in the Jordan. He tells it in a way that sounds as if it was not that significant. Just as it was just something that happened one day in those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. But, but packed in that first verse, there is uh, a remarkable uh, words of importance that I think we would, we would do well to, to stop and, and meditate on. As I said before, Mark's writing from Rome. He's writing to Romans. He's, he's writing to an, an audience that is predominantly Gentile. He's not writing to a, a Jewish audience. Certainly there, 
There were likely Jews who were scattered among them, but it was predominantly a, a Gentile audience. I mean, it's important to know that Mark wants his first readers to understand, and he wants us to understand something of where Jesus came from. He informs us that Jesus came to be baptized from Nazareth of Galilee. What do we know about Galilee? Galilee was originally part of the land that was conquered by Joshua. was technically and originally considered Jewish land, but eventually it was raided by the Assyrians, and the Assyrians sent the vast majority of the Jewish people away. They deported them, sent them out of this region of Galilee. So much so that by the time that Jesus came... Though technically Galilee was Jewish, it was inhabited almost exclusively by Gentiles. It was commonly referred to as Galilee of the Gentiles. In fact, when Isaiah prophesied about the coming Christ, he referred to it as Galilee of the Gentiles. So so Galilee was a place that was treated with hatred and scorn from the Jews. We see this towards the end of Mark's gospel is... Peter is being treated with contempt after Jesus is arrested and a little girl proclaimed about Peter. Isn't he one of those Galileans? There there is this uh, sort of tone of contempt and scorn in her voice. Aren't you one of those lowlifes? One of those Galileans? One of those who was with Jesus? You talk like he talked. You, You don't sound like us. You seem like an outsider. There was a a note of of, of scorn in her voice. Well, we see this even more clearly in John chapter 1, beginning in verse 43, as Jesus is, is calling his first disciples. It says this, The next day Jesus decided to go to Galilee and found Philip, and he said to him, Follow me. Now, Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Nathanael said to him, Can anything good come from Nazareth? Mark wants us to, to understand that Jesus is coming out to be baptized by John in the Jordan, not from Jerusalem, not from the high places, not from places which were highly esteemed or highly regarded, but he was coming out to be baptized in the wilderness from Nazareth in Galilee. For the Jews, the reality was this. The farther you were from the temple... The further you were from Jerusalem, the further you were from God. So they looked at those who lived in these far off regions with contempt, with scorn. In fact, in in John chapter 7, verse 40, some of the people, when they heard the words of Jesus, they said, This certainly is the prophet. John says others were saying, this is the Christ. And others were saying about Jesus, surely the Christ isn't going to come from Galilee, is he? This can't be the Christ. I mean, if Jesus was going to come, if if Messiah was here, he would be someone of prestige, someone of honor. He'd be from Jerusalem. He would be someone of significance, someone of importance. It was unthinkable for some that Messiah would come from Galilee, this Galilee of the Gentiles. But it seems, even in the first century, they were ignorant of the Word of God. Isaiah had prophesied long before the birth of Christ. There will be no more gloom for her her who was in anguish. In, in, early, in earlier times, he treated the land of Naphtali with contempt, but later on he shall make it glorious by way of the sea on the other side of the Jordan. Galilee of the Gentiles, the people who walk in darkness will see a, a great light, the light 
will shine upon them. As I said, for the people of Israel, the further you were from Jerusalem, the further you were away from the temple, the more disdain they had from you. And Galilee was a long, long way from Jerusalem. It's a place of scorn. It's a place of rejection. It's no small thing that Mark wants his Gentile audience to understand. It's no small thing that Mark, inspired by the Holy Spirit, wants us to understand. That as John was busy doing the work that God had called him to of baptizing people, calling Israel out into the desert, he looks up and he sees a man from Nazareth in Galilee named Jesus. Behold. The Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And so in verse 10 of the passage we're looking at this morning, this one who was despised and rejected, this no-name king from a nothing town, The one that John had come to proclaim. The king is here to receive his crown. This king who was born in the most humble of circumstances. Not not born in, in the temple. Not born in a palace. Not born to people of any esteem. Not even born to a, a woman who was, was married at the time. Born of a virgin in a lowly stable in the middle of the night from nowhere. This is God's chosen king. A man from Nazareth in Galilee. Mark tells us in verse 10, when he came up out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens being torn open, the Spirit descending on him like a dove. That word immediately, we're going to see that a lot throughout the Gospel of Mark. Mark wants to get to the action. He doesn't give a whole lot of detail, and Mark jumps immediately from event to event. And so Mark says, immediately as Jesus was coming up out of the water, he he came up and, and, and immediately the heavens were being torn open. And he saw the Spirit descending on Jesus like a dove. This is, in in every way, the confirmation that this is the king that the people had been waiting for. This is the one true king, the king of kings, the Lord of lords. John had come to proclaim that the king is coming. And now God is going to give voice and give picture to the fact that this is his son, the son of God, the king of kings. The language that Mark uses here is really significant. The word that our Bible translates as as torn, it it says immediately he came up and the heavens were being torn, torn apart. The the heavens were being ripped apart and the Spirit of God descended on him like a dove. The Greek word that is translated as torn is the word schizo. It's only used one other time in the New Testament. Mark says immediately after Jesus' baptism, as he was coming up out of the water, the heavens were torn apart. He uses the exact same word in Mark chapter 15, verse 33. If you would turn to Mark 15, as we look at the only other use of this one word, schizo, which is translated as torn, from Mark 15. See if you see the, the significance of This same word that Mark only uses two times. He's now telling of the death of Jesus. He says, when the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lemma sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Some of the bystanders hearing it said, behold, he's, he's calling Elijah. Someone ran and filled a sponge with sour wine and put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink, saying, Wait, let us see whether Elijah will come and take him down. And Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed his last. And the 
curtain of the temple was torn. Schizo, the exact same word, only used twice. It says the temple of the curtain was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion who stood facing him saw that in this way he breathed his last, he said, surely this man was the Son of God. Twice in his gospel and only twice in the New Testament is this one Greek word used. And it's the exact same word that Mark uses to tell us that the moment that Jesus came up out of the water after being baptized, the heavens were torn apart and the Spirit of God came down to confirm that this is the Son of God. And a voice from God came from on high proclaiming, this is my Son. And we don't see that word again until Jesus breathes his last breath. And in that moment, ha- having accomplished everything that God had set forth for him to accomplish, the curtain of the temple, which separated the Spirit of God from the people of God, was torn apart. Ripped from top to bottom as there is now no separation between God and man. Mark's language is intentional. Superintended by the Holy Spirit for us to understand that this is not just another Jewish man from an unknown region coming to be baptized by John in the Jordan. This is the coronation of the king. This is the the King of Kings, the long-awaited Messiah that God's people had been waiting on for generation after generation, for century after century to come and set them free from their sin, to set them free from the bondage that they had even to death. As the Spirit descends on Jesus and the voice of God declares, You are my beloved Son. With you, I am well pleased. Mark can think of no better way to begin the gospel about Jesus Christ than by helping his Gentile hearers understand this is the true king. Those Roman Gentiles who lived under the oppression of Caesar who claims to be God Mark wanted them to know there is a king who is God. And his name's not Caesar. It's Jesus. He sent John as a herald to proclaim the king is coming. And the king came. His coronation was not attended to by military leaders or military bands. The coronation of this king was not celebrated with great feasts and great parades. It was not commemorated with uh, these tremendous public shows of, of gratitude and adoration. It was witnessed by the people of God who saw the Spirit of God and heard the voice of God proclaiming, this is my son. This is your king. The king of kings. The Lord of lords. Mark wants us to understand, first and foremost, that Jesus is the king, the long-awaited king, who will reign and rule over God's people for all eternity. He's come, and his name is Jesus. He wants us to understand that, first and foremost. Second, Mark wants us to understand that everything about this king is different. This king didn't come in power to conquer us, at least not the first time. He came in weakness. He came as a suffering servant to suffer and die, to demonstrate the perfect sacrificial love of the Father, not in His power, but in His weakness, as demonstrated by the humility of the cross. Mark wants us to understand that this King came to suffer and die so that all who are willing to repent and believe in Him might be saved. He wants us to understand that Jesus is the king, but that this king is different from every other worldly king. So what does this king do? Immediately, 
after being coronated, announced as the King of Kings, having seen the Spirit of God descend on him like a dove and heard the audible voice of God declare, This is my Son. Does this king then ascend and go and take his rightful place as the ruler over the temple or go and immediately start to eradicate all of the the foreign oppressors from Israel? What does this king do? What is his first act? His first act of power and might and majesty and greatness? Well, it says this. The Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. And he was in the wilderness 40 days, being tempted by Satan. He was with the wild animals, and the angels were ministering to him. The first act of God's king, the eternal king, the king of kings, the Lord of lords. He retreats into the wilderness. Mark his gospel in introducing us to the king. He, he's trying to draw our hearts and our minds away from all of the high places and all of the religiosity and, and all of the, 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 the great and powerful things of the world into the desert, which is what God had always used to prepare his people for his coming. Just as Moses, the first redeemer over God's people, went up on the mountain for 40 days in preparation to lead God's people through the wilderness and into the promised land that God had given them as an inheritance, so Jesus, the final redeemer, withdraws for 40 days prior to the beginning of his earthly ministry. As we begin our time in this important book, the Gospel of Mark, Mark introduces the Gospel, the very first verse of the Gospel of Mark. Mark says, this is the beginning of the good news, the Gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Mark wants us to understand two things in this passage, that Jesus is King, but that this King is different. He's not like the worldly kings. In 1 Samuel, when... The people of God came to the prophet Samuel. They asked for a king. They were looking at the nations around them, and all the nations around them had kings. And so the people of God, they came to the prophet Samuel, and they said, Samuel, we want you to make for us a king so that we can be like the other nations. And Samuel looks at him, he said, do you understand that God wants for him alone to be your king? God wants you not to serve any earthly kings. God wants you to operate as if he is your king. And Samuel said to the people, don't you understand how this works? He said, earthly kings, they take from you. He's trying to talk them out of their desire to have a king set over them. And so the prophet Samuel, he says, listen, earthly kings, this is what they're going to do. They're going to take your sons to serve in their army, and they're going to take your daughters to serve in their palace, and they're going to take a portion of everything that you produce as a tax to support their army. He said, earthly kings, that's what they do by nature. Earthly kings, they take from people. This king, anointed by God, came not to take, but to give his life as a ransom for ours. My hope is that as we immerse ourselves in this important book, the Gospel of Mark, that we will see the good news of Jesus Christ, that he is the Son of God, the King of kings who came not to take from us, but to give to us everything. All life, all godliness, all righteousness, Victory over sin, even victory over death, was given to us by this king who came to give his life as a ransom for ours. Let's pray. King Jesus, we thank you.
that we don't have to speculate along with the rest of the world who you were and who you are. Even as we look to our own nation, our own cities, and we see people clamoring for control, and we see people desperate for peace and desperate for justice. God, we know that we serve a king who came not to take anything from us, but to offer his life as a ransom for ours. This king, King Jesus, you came to give freely of your own life so that we who are enemies of God might receive forgiveness. God, I thank you for your word which reveals to us King Jesus. And and Lord, we know that many in Jesus' day, they, they, they missed that Jesus was king because they were looking for a different kind of king. God, I pray that that would not be true for us. God, that we wouldn't be looking for a a King Jesus of our own imagination or of our own creation, but that we would look to your holy and inspired word, which reveals to us who King Jesus is. God, as I prayed before, I, I pray again that your spirit would illuminate the truth of this text, that you would allow us to see this King Jesus for who he is, a good King, the Son of God who took on flesh, who walked in perfect righteousness for all of his days, the the only man who ever lived who didn't deserve death because in him there was no sin, and yet he became sin so that we might become the righteousness of Christ. God, I pray that your spirit would allow every single one of us to understand this, to internalize it, and to respond by giving our lives in service to this good King Jesus who died so that we might be set free. Father, we love you. We pray these things in the strong name of our good King Jesus. Listen, I want to invite you, as I do every week, to respond to the proclamation that Jesus is King. This King came to die for you, for me, for all who would believe. It's my conviction that every time God's Word is proclaimed, every person who hears it should respond to that proclamation. Maybe you need to respond by turning from sin and trusting in this King Jesus Maybe today's the first time that you, you, you really heard and understood the truth about what Jesus came to do. Not to take from you, but to give his life as ransom for yours. Maybe your response today is that you need to respond by turning from sin and trusting in Christ. You can, you can do that right where you're at. You can also do that by coming forward. And if, if you want to come forward, we'd love for our staff to be able to pray with you. Maybe, maybe you just need to, to respond by, by repenting of the fact that you, you, even though you've trusted Jesus, you've really been trying to operate as if you are your own king. You've been clamoring for control in your life. You've been trying to orchestrate all of the events of your life as if, as if you really are the king. Maybe you need to just come and confess that though you've trusted Christ, you, you've allowed some idols to come in. There's some things that you, you have allowed to be the king over your life. And maybe today you just want to repent and confess that you want to get rid of those idols. Maybe you want to respond by coming forward and indicating that you've never followed through in obedience through baptism. This King Jesus said, We need to make disciples of all nations and baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. That the the evidence for the church that we have trusted in this King Jesus is, is baptism, public profession of faith. Maybe that's your response today. You want to come forward and say, you know what, I've never publicly professed my faith through baptism. Maybe you want to unite with this church in membership. 
we'd love if that's where you are to have a conversation with you about that. I, I don't know what, what it is that you, you're wrestling with, but I do know this, that every time God's word is proclaimed, every person who hears it is called to response. So let's respond together as we sing this song.